Some things work best when paired with another, like peanut butter and jelly, cold beer in a hockey game, socks and sandals. Well, the same holds true with music and some of the best songs have come from the collaboration of two musicians. Today we're looking at how seven iconic rock and roll duos met. But before we do that, I wanna quickly tell you about my brand new merch line, the traditional guitar playing samurai. It's available for a limited time in a number of different styles and colors over at shopsamuraiguitarist.com. For more details, wait till the end of the video or check the description. Anyways, let's dive in. To start things off, we're looking at perhaps the most iconic songwriting duo of them all, John Lennon and Paul McCartney. In the summer of 1957, John's band, The Quarrymen, were playing their second ever performance in the back of a moving truck. Earlier in the day, John had gotten into a big fight with his aunt and proceeded to get rather drunk, making it fairly difficult to keep his balance on the moving stage. Despite this, John's vocals and banjo playing impressed a young Paul McCartney who was in the crowd. They were introduced after the set and what ultimately broke the ice was the fact that Paul knew how to tune a guitar. Up until then, whenever their instruments would go out of tune, John and the band would take their guitars across town to a fellow who would help them out. On top of this, Paul played a couple rock and roll tunes and his talent clearly left an impression on John and it wasn't long after that Paul was asked to join the band. Next on our list are the only two remaining original members of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Anthony Kiedis and Flea. Anthony had started his first year of high school at Fairfax High where he befriended a small, tiny little kid named Tony. And in Anthony's words, about a month into the school year, Tony and I were talking in the quad at lunchtime when a tiny, crazy looking, gap-toothed, big-haired kid came waltzing up to Tony, put him in a headlock and started roughing him up. Anthony stepped in to protect his friend and the other kid backed down. Kiedis recalled, It's weird, even though we were starting off on this aggressiveness, I felt an instant connection to the remarkable little weirdo. That little weirdo's name was Michael Balzari, soon to be known to the world as Flea. Moving on, we have the duo responsible for such songs as Tiny Dancer, Candle in the Wind, Rocket Man, and many others, Bernie Taupin and Elton John. In 1967, Liberty Records put out an ad seeking talented musicians and songwriters in London, England. Both both Bernie and Elton John responded to the ad, but neither were successful. Bernie was a lyricist who struggled with music while Elton had the opposite problem. When Elton told the auditioner about his inability to write lyrics, the man grabbed an envelope from the pile of submitted lyrics on his desk and gave it to Elton. That envelope contained poems written by Toppin which Elton decided to put to music. They started off their journey together as staff songwriters, Bernie taking care of the lyrics while Elton took care of the music before eventually collaborating on Elton's first record. It was the second single off his second record, Your Song, which put them on the map and cemented a partnership which has since spanned over 50 years. Next on our list are the toxic twins of Aerosmith, Steven Tyler and Joe Perry. Both Steven and Joe would spend many days in the summers of their youth at a small lakeside town called Sunapee, New Hampshire. One day Steven went to eat at a local restaurant called The Anchorage. He recalls, I'm sitting there eating some french fries and I realized these are the best french fries I've ever had in my life. So being me, I had to go see who made them. The fry cook was a kid named Joe Perry who apparently wasn't a big fan of Steven Tyler. Steven and his friends would often come in, make a big mess, and he was the one who had to clean it up. Fast forward a few years and Steven sees Joe Perry playing in a band creatively named The Jam Band. He recalls, They couldn't sing, they couldn't tune their instruments, and they were sloppy and they just sucked but they were great. The next day, Steven found Joe and presented him with the idea of starting their own band. Moving on, we have the two members of the undeniably greatest rock and roll band of them all, Kyle Gass and Jack Black of Tenacious D. In 1985, the pair were both members of Tim Robbins' theater group, The Actors Gang. And yes, that is the same Tim Robbins who portrayed Andy Dufresne in The Shawshank Redemption. The two didn't instantly hit it off. Jack Black has admitted that when he joined the group, he stepped on a couple toes and it would take some time before Kyle gas warmed up to him. They were stuck working together on a musical piece when, in Jack's words, we eventually realized if we joined forces we could be an indestructible force of entertainment. He was right. And bonus fun fact, their first ever big screen debut was a background performance in the movie Biodome, a film commonly considered one of the worst of all time. Oh, the humble beginnings of rock and roll greatness. Whenever it was that Mick Jagger met Keith Richards for the first time is lost to the history books. The two grew up one street over from each other and played together frequently as children before eventually falling out. Fast forward a few years and they reunited as teenagers in 
Avengers in 1961 on a Dartford train station platform. Mick was carrying a Chuck Berry record as well as one by Muddy Waters and Keith was carrying his guitar. They struck up a conversation and Mick invited Keith back to his place to listen to the records. It wasn't long after that Mick invited Keith to join his band Little Boy Blue and the Blue Boys. They would end up forming the Rolling Stones with another blues man named Brian Jones. They took the name from a Muddy Waters song of the same name. And that track was found on the record that Mick was carrying the day him and Keith hit it off. And last on our list is the historically volatile but currently on good terms duo Slash and Axl Rose. The first meeting between these two was entirely uneventful. Slash auditioned for Axl's band after responding to a classified ad seeking a guitarist. Nothing came of it and they both went their separate ways. A little while later, Slash went to see the band Hollywood Rose and in his words, it was the first time I beheld the best singer in Hollywood at the time, W. Axl Rose. After the band fired their guitar player, rumor got out that they were auditioning and Slash showed up at their dingy rehearsal space. Everything was going fine until the rhythm guitarist Izzy Stradlin up and left unexpectedly mid-song. There was a brief moment of awkwardness, no one knew what to make of it, but they counted in the next song and everything gelled. Slash joined Hollywood Rose, which would soon become Guns N' Roses. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. That's how seven iconic rock and roll duos met. I hope you enjoyed this video. I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I've officially launched my first ever merchandise line, the traditional guitar playing samurai. It's available in a number of different styles and colors over at shopsamuraiguitarist.com. I'm doing a limited run to test the water, so get one while quantities last. Thank you all for watching, and a big thank you to everyone who supports my channel through Patreon. If you're new here, make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that link over there to check out another video. I'm Samurai Guitarist, and until next time, I'll see you again soon.